All right, now uh, what we have all been waiting for, a uh, keynote by Chris Lübkeman. Um, uh, yeah, you need a fuse. That's what you wanted to do, I see. Um, Chris is an Arab fellow and director of Global Foresight Research and Innovation. Chris asked me to keep it short, which I appreciate, but I'll nonetheless say a few things that uh, Chris has a particular affinity with ETH, which we value very much, uh, not only having done his doctorate, but also having been on the faculty. And then he went on to go some uh, lesser known places like MIT and uh, to then end up at Arab to basically um, kind of look carefully at our globally changing um, world and how we can basically uh, do something about it, but also taking these changes as opportunities of how to go forward. Uh, I'm super excited that you uh, will address us and provoke us and uh, probably also feed into the panel afterwards. Uh, Chris Lübkeman, uh, let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Yeah, that's a little bit better. I'll try again. Hello, everybody. Yeah, there you go. That's much better. How many of you are ETH students or faculty? Put your hands up. How many of you are here at the ETH for the very first time? Awesome. Great to see you here. Um, how many of you have come from Asia? Look around. Put your hands up. Australasia? Do you guys get the prize for long distance? North America? South America? Yeah, all right. Um, Antarctica, anyone? <laughs> oh, we got one, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, continental Europe, big bit, and Africa. All right, here we go. So the world is here at the Eteha, and it's really fantastic that you're here. Um, I want to thank uh, Lino, who's departed, for having the faith to create this institution which we're here participating in to Philippe and my former students Fabio and Matias for the invitation to come and the wonderful NCCR team for uh, making it very easy to come here. When they asked me if I would do this, I don't think they knew that I actually fell in love with concrete when I was in high school. Now you're not supposed to fall in love with concrete in high school, that's not really a normal thing to do. But um, I did, and my very first job was working on the dome of the elephant house of the Cincinnati Zoo, which was deteriorating, and my stepfather's best friend was the engineer working on it, and he knew I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer, so he had me come and help. So in that summer of my uh, senior year, I got to go and walk on a dome which was built in 1904, trying to figure out how strong a 1904 concrete, reinforced concrete dome was. I learned two very important lessons then. Number one, I could prove unequivocally that that dome had no reason to stand. I could prove unequivocally that that dome would be there forever, all based on the assumptions that you make. And to me, that was a really important lesson which took me through my education, is how important it is that we consider the assumptions that we are making, not only about what we're doing today, but the assumptions about what we're going to be doing tomorrow and the day after. I came to Switzerland because of Christian men. I fell in love with Bridges when I was at Cornell. I was introduced to him and his Bridges. I asked to come and study with him, and he accepted it, and it was crazy that I, he did that. And he introduced me to Santiago Calatrava, where I then went to do the structural analysis of the Stadelhofen Bridge and do all the structural modeling. But what I learned from him was the incredible difference between calculating and designing. I had been educated as a structural calculator at Vanderbilt, at Cornell. I could do the givens and the finds, and I knew how to find an answer. But Christian Professor Men taught me that you can feel forces. You have to be able to see forces and be able to bend them to understand how they move. And that was structural design. And for me, when I think about the difference between calculating 
and designing, I also think about the tool sets, which we're now going to be embracing. The artificial intelligence, the machine learning, that can take a lot of the calculating out of our hands, out of our pockets, and give us more time to work with that, to design. For many, that will be wonderful. For others, that will be very fearful. Grasshoppers. How many of you catch grasshoppers, and how many of you code with it? How many of you code grasshopper? How many of you go catch grasshoppers? Oh, come on. No one does that? How many of you have no idea what I'm asking? <laughs> All right. There's only two hands up in there. It's very interesting. It's very often a generational thing. This sort of a loaded question with this audience, yeah. How many of you would let your refrigerator plan your meals? If your refrigerator could plan your meals for you, up for it? Yes? No way? Maybe, not quite so sure? Depends on the language. It's an Italian refrigerator. Yes, no. Refrigerators can do that now. At MIT, we did the very first microwave that could scan the products. Samsung has product now which can tell you and show you what's in your refrigerator. Go online, search, and tell you what you can eat or what you shouldn't eat. Does car ownership give you pleasure or pain? How many of you love car ownership? There's only five hands that went up. How many think it's an absolute pain? How many of you don't really care because you don't own a car? <laughs> yeah, here in, here in Europe you can do that. That's not so easy in San Francisco. But it's quite interesting with the sharing economy and where this is going to go when we understand this new economic model, which we're all stepping into, Airbnb or whatever, you know, you pick it. What will ownership of assets mean, and what does that mean for what we are doing in the creation and curation of the built environment? What will that mean? I was at TED last year, and I sat next to this wonderful old Texan, 90-something years old, had a couple heart bypass surgeries already, Jim Young, and he turned to me and he said, in a beautiful Texan drawl, which I will not imitate, he said, Chris, are you learning as fast as the world is changing? And I'm looking at Jim, this 90-year-old man, he's at the front row of Ted, just absorbing what's, what, what he can. And I'm thinking to myself, it's my job at Arup to have a team that who is learning. This is our job, to help make sure that we are as far in front as practical and as possible. And I stopped and thought, am I learning fast enough? And I had to say, attending, I, I was very fortunate to be able to come in Monday, attending some of the sessions with Digital Concrete, I clearly am not learning fast enough because I learned all sorts of things which I had no idea I needed to know. Right? So I challenge all of us in this room to think to ourselves if we are learning fast enough about the things which we need to be learning about. When I looked down in that room and felt the buzz that was in that and with all the workshops, it was phenomenal. And I can say absolutely those 200 folks were learning fast enough, probably faster than you thought you were going to. For the past 19 years, I have spent two, sometimes three weeks a month, literally traveling around the world, visiting our offices, looking at our planet to see what we are doing to craft, to create places and spaces to allow us not to just to survive, but to thrive. And it's quite phenomenal to look what we do and have been doing to our planet. And through all these travels, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to meet incredible people, to see amazing things, and there's certain lessons which I have been able to learn. One of those is that change is constant. We cannot stop change. We cannot gate it away. We cannot put a border around change and ask for a change passport. We can't do that. The second is that the future is fiction. It is a story which every one of us in this room is authoring every day. We are the co-authors of that story, and we have to believe that we are doing that, to believe that we are writing a story worth walking into, 
to think, what is the story that we want to see become real? And what can we be doing to make that story real? Because the third thing is participation is what shapes the world. By coming here this week, tonight, you are participating. And hopefully, you're shaping a worldview. Your world will have changed in some way, in a last, any lasting set. Won't go back. Something will have changed in this week. And those three, for me, are quite important. I'm going to give you about three or four more in the next 30 minutes. These are very important to me. How many of you recognize this movie? Shout it out. Okay, who, who, what is it? Blade Runner. When was Blade Runner in the film, in the studios? What's that? 1980, 19, it was 1982. Pretty close. 80, 82. Whatever, you know, for most of you, half of you weren't even born then. So it opened in 1982, and it was predicting or projecting a world which is supposed to be November of 2019. Now, if you go back and look at the original Blade Runner and imagine that was the vision of the future, when I saw it, because I saw it in the theaters, it blew my mind I could imagine that would be the world we're coming into. Because science fiction writers and films always oversell the future, but they always underimagine the future. There's something we're very good at as humans, is to oversell and underimagine. I'm sure today Apple probably oversold and underimagined what's going to come out on the market. Who knows? So I'm going to add that to the three. The future is oversold and it's underimagined. And sometimes people get it wrong. If you go back and you look at what the president of the Royal Society said in 1895, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, well, he kind of got that very wrong, as we all know. Now, I remember the day that this ship landed. I was at university at Vanderbilt at my fraternity with my cook. I was the house manager with our cook, watching that thing land on a TV that was this size in black and white. Right? Yes, TVs actually were this size in black and white. And I even remember that. That was any, you know. No, you can Google it for those who don't believe me. They really did exist. And both of us were sitting there crying for different reasons, probably. Me, because I just, it was so cool that we could actually go into space and come back. And probably, and, and Cookie, because she just couldn't imagine that uh, humans could do that. You know, she was a very straightforward, simple, wonderful person. But that bird went up 27 times. And he got that very wrong. It wasn't long. Uh, if you go back in time, in 1912, it was predicted we were going to go to the moon in eight hours. By 2012, it takes about 100 hours. It took last time. There's telemedicine was already predicted in 1925. And if you take a look at this wonderful little image of this guy with these, I don't know what the heck those little haptic interfaces are. They're kind of scary. But already this imagination was ripe to try to think what could happen. I think the only, the most wrong thing about this is, you know, the more women are going into med school than men, so watch out, dude. President Eisenhower's Committee on the Weather Control said in 1953 that we were going to think about how they could make weather to order. I think we've done that with climate change anyway. I'm not quite sure it's what we ordered, but it was, it's there. And the one I wanted to share, which I just love, is this one when I thought of digital concrete. And you could imagine these 3D printed balls rolling around, robotically created, and there you go. That is the link between these two. But if for me, in 1925, if you think of the time, the explosion and the belief of what was happening at that time, that makes a lot more sense. And also... We kind of look at how crazy it is, how silly, but how fun, how free to imagine that moving, this tractor kind of pulling it away. But we also know this classic diagram, Gartner's diagram of you have a technology, you've got these inflated, it's overselling, you've got the trough of disillusionment, and that's to me where those little concrete balls stopped, they got stuck right there in that trough of disillusionment. Slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity. We heard this morning in the closing from Digital Concrete with additive manufacturing, we're not even hardly 
out anywhere with it, with far the S curve. We're right at the very bottom, so so far to go. If you look at a lot of the robotics, where are you with that? An awful lot of them inflated expectations. So when I was thinking about that, I was going, where are we when we're looking at these different materials? The different geometries. Do we know, actually, can you imagine where you're going to take that as you're thinking about what could be? And walking around the lab was just beautiful to see these laser-centered, these objects, these incredible geometries that coming back to nature, imitating nature, or maybe a nightmare. I'm not quite sure what that was. It was quite phenomenal to see and feel the materials and think of where we could go with that. And not just imitating, as every material does, and that imitation at first, but where do we go once we understand its potential to put a structure back into pure compression and actually have that sit and stay over time? And the one that really caught my mind the most was the idea that we could have truly fabric as formwork three-dimensionally printed with little balloons in there, and to actually begin to think, could you see a bunch of contractors carrying their formwork in their backpack, a bunch of knitting, say, go knit your formwork. I'm not quite sure how that's going to change that industry, that macho industry. But I thought it was really quite phenomenal to look at what that could be. The augmented reality glasses became able to look at the, what you could do to move the bend the steel to place the objects in place. We saw this sort of high expectation, the trough of disillusionment, and now we're coming back to where things could and should and will be. I'll talk about this in a minute. This, I wasn't quite sure how to get my head around as far as the Mars rover and robots, but then... Quite literally, uh, last Friday, Boston Dynamics called me up and said, look, we want to get into construction. And I thought to myself, okay, we're going to see spot on the construction sites. And it was more interesting to me not them calling, but to recognize that our industry, with that graph which Lino showed, is under the telescope and the microscope. And we will change. We will be changed. The people who made the most interesting robotic arm that I saw in San Francisco last week did not have a civil engineer or an architect on the team. It was pneumatically controlled, making drywall, finishing drywall. It was only mechanical engineers and, and systems engineers. We weren't even there until they finally said, oh, yeah, maybe we need to talk to a contractor. So we need to make sure that we're engaging in that dialogue, and that's what this place is doing. And I'm sure many of your labs are doing the same thing. And in this, I ask myself, what do we imagine that normal will be on a job site? What will normal be in a design process? If we went, like Lena said, if we went back 50 years and talked to someone, how different would it be? And the most important question is, what do we want it to be, the futurist fiction? What's the story we're trying to create? Can we write that story, that day in the life of a construction worker, the day in the life of a building engineer or roboticist? What is that going to look like? Recognize that one? How? 2001 A Space Odyssey. How many have not seen it? Who's never seen 2001 Space Odyssey? One, two, three. Everyone else has seen 2001? Well, that's impressive. You're the first audience to have a majority that's ever seen it. I watched it on an airplane not too long ago. I do lots of flights. I fell asleep. You know, it's really a boring movie, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it was quite phenomenal. So you remember the scene where it says, Dave, I'm afraid I can't let you do that because Dave, the astronaut, has been bricked out of the spaceship, right, out, out of the orbital. He's outside. The computer won't let him back in. And now, you know, we know that cars will not let you in. We have the capability. If you're drunk or stoned, the car can, te can tell and not let you in, right? Or a house, an apartment will brick you, not let you in. When this came out in 1968, that was absolutely impossible to imagine. Even more so, it was written on that typewriter, right? That's what 2001 A Space Odyssey was written on. The technology of the day. Now, the interesting thing for me with this 
is this scene where he's talking to his daughter. Now, I've traveled a lot, and my daughter is now 21, grew up for 19 of her years, talking to me through iChat and through various video conferencing from different parts of the world. And that was, for me, very important. For her, I'm not quite so sure, but for me, it was really important also for my son. And this is a very interesting scene because this was not the first time that video conferencing was even presented. It was already presented in the Bell Labs World's Fair of 1964, and that wasn't the first time either. That was based on work at the AT&T Labs in the early 60s, which I love, online shopping. And the best part of this of all are the two kids, which are pixelated right now, who are smiling, right? I'm going, yet yeah, every parent knows that no kids are going to walk to the school in the rain smiling. You know, that's not going to happen. But here we have online shopping and video conferencing, and that was based upon the German Deutsche Reichspost from 1936 that already had point-to-point -point video conferencing between major cities within Germany. A little thing happened that kind of took that away. But that was already working then, but that was kind of based on Fritz Lang's idea of, you know, between the upper class and the lower class, 1927, Metropolis. That was, goes back to the telephonoscope from Edison from 1879. There's a great dialogue at the bottom, which I'm not going to read, which goes back into the 1850s, where you can see this first idea of being someplace else was already presented. Now, why is that important for us? For me, it's important for three things. Number one, it shows how, as humans, we have always wanted to be connected. We want to be with people we love. We want to be connected with those we care about. We're also curious, the second part. We're curious about other places. And the third is I call the slingshot. When we're looking forward as to what's going to happen, what needs to happen, it's important that we look at history and to remember the lessons of the past, the ideas of the past, so that we can spring forward more and forward, more informed, because when we're looking forward, this cone of the possible is huge. The cone of the probable, that little dart in the middle where we're kind of heading, it kind of is a little bit smaller, but the preferable is the smallest piece of all. And that preferable future, that preferable convergence of our co connected talent sets is where we need to focus and to be sure that we've got the story clear about where we think that needs to be. That we understand that context into which we are, walk into which we are walking. How many of you started with one of these? The, the real drafting board. How many of you still have one? How many of you have never seen a real desktop? Yeah. This is a real desktop, okay? That's not. This is just baloney. This is a real desktop, right? The good old parallel rule, so fun. How about this? Oh, here's a collective groan. Yeah, right, yes. Right? The good old, the good old Rotring, you know? This is ink. Ink on mylar, and each color is a different size. How many of you still, how many of you still use them? A few, a few diehards. There you go. All right. Now, for those who never had the pleasure of putting ink on mylar, basically you're drawing ink lines on plastic, you make a mistake, you get out the razor blade, and you start scratching, and you hope that you don't make a hole in that. Because <laughs> if you make a hole in that plastic, in that mylar, you've got to make a big cut and hope you can repair it. And it always happens about an hour before you have to turn in the drawing, right? It was hell. Nothing fun about it, but it made beautiful lines. You had to make a decision about the line weight, right? There was no control Z. You had to think an awful lot before you committed anything. How about these? My first job as a junior, junior engineer was to run blueprints, blueprint machine. It's ammonia, completely stoned by lunch, <laughs> right? The ammonia high, it's not to be really, it's not a good one, but it was, you know, right? And the rest of the afternoon, you're just staggering around trying to make sure you get the drawings of the right person, you know, kind of laughing. But that was not fun, right? This whole thing was not fun. The point of this is everything inconvenient will change. If we think about the process of design, the process of construction, the process of the creation of what we do, 
If it's inconvenient, it will go away. It will be obviated. Think about what happened with ATMs, the post office. Think about our lives and how we define convenience. Now, how we define convenience depends upon culture and time. But think about this when we're looking at our robotics and we're looking at our new materials. What is convenient and what will go away? When we went from slide rules, which I still have one, you know, we were going to put 150 old white men, and that was going to replace it with one calculator. And then HP got clever, and it created a new calculating machine, the electronic slide rule. Now, the obvious thing to ask in this room is how many of you, all the HP people should come over here, and all the Texas Instruments folks should all come over on this side, right? Uh, sort of a different kind of logic about how your brain worked. And then, of course, the introduction of the PC. There's nothing about that little handheld calculator which was really convenient, actually. It was better than the slide rule, and this as well. Now, what I really remember so well when I was here as an assistant was going down to the material centrale and begging the guy behind the counter for a little tiny floppy disk and him grilling me about why I needed two, right? And I think that had only 256K, right? and we would just all laugh at them now, but I remember that very distinctly, right? So everything inconvenient will change. Today, memory and computation is essentially free, right? So now what do we do? Now what? Everything inconvenient will change. I find it quite intriguing because not everything has to be high tech. It's very inconvenient to have a little table that's on tiles. You have four legs and tiles. This is up at the Schatz Alp in Davos because they always wobble, right? The Paris tables, they always wobble. You know what they do up there? They get a little wedge. <laughs> it's the simplest, most wonderful solution that's guaranteed to work every time. This is convenient. So when we're talking about convenience, we have to also think about what's the appropriate technology that can be applied in that right time, in that moment, in that place. And here it works. I'm pr probably in San Francisco, the wedge was a bit ripped off, or New York, get ripped off and wouldn't survive. But the shots out, they're still there. So everything inconvenient will change in an era of augmentation which we are in right now. We are augmenting, we are augmenting ourselves with joints. My stepfather has four new leg joints. We're augmenting our muscles, cochlear implants, our hearing. With CRISPR, we can now augment our genetic makeup. We're augmenting our sensing, our capabilities to sense, to look at con conditional data flows. We know where every single, the Swiss government knows that every single one of us is in this room right now, right? They know through our phones where we are. They can sense where people moving through cities. We know the amount of electricity and every plug. We can do all that. Noise, air pollution, CO2 in the room, the room temperature. We can know all that. We're augmenting our thinking. Who doesn't go into a meeting with their smartphone? I mean, I've been disabled because somehow my phone doesn't get me internet here. And it's driving me crazy because I'm always, always asking the phone, asking the oracle, right? It's augmenting our intelligence, if you will, our search capabilities, our artificial intelligence machine learning. I'm not sure if you've ever met Erica. I saw this ad about two, maybe three years ago. It was fascinating. And Erica was out from the UBS. And Erica is who answers the phone when you call. Because Erica knows when you ask the question wh whether you're stressed, whether you're upset, whether you're happy, whether you have a simple query. Within a second, it can tell through your voice your emotional state. There are some parts of the world who are looking at moving the emergency services first call, the 911 or 411, to an artificial intelligence. So it can, it can tell what you need before you can articulate it by your panting or your whatever you're doing, right? Now, I'm not saying I like this. I, when I go to the airports, I always go to the counter and get a ticket and talk to the person. I'm sure many of you just don't even want to see a person, but I'm that person who goes and says, hi, how are you? Yeah, you have a good day? No, okay. And this is part of our new reality. Glare, 
is fascinating. We can tell the glare in that top left picture. There's no, algor- there's no formula to tell us that that's glare. But we can teach an algorithm what is glare in an image and what's not. So we, can, we did that. So now we have a tool where you can look and show on any site, on any building site, where what will be glary and what won't be. Or this. This is clash detection. When you're putting in a new uh, light rail system, in this case Auckland, you need to go and for your different lines figure out is this road going to be better to put the line down or that road. And yet the clashes are all the sewers, the electric lines, all the stuff that might get in the way of that line. This takes thousands of hours to do by hand or do on the computer. We've trained an algorithm to do that in an hour or two. I won't tell you exactly how much, because we still get paid by the hour, right? So I'm not going to tell you. But it used to take about 8,000, right, to do that whole thing, right? So, and this is what it looks like. That's the algorithm. This is the knowledge embedded from the engineers into the algorithm. To, that, and that, to me, is incredible. Because this tool set, was at the Arab exhibit at the Victorian Albert Museum last year. And I recognized everything in that tool set that my grandfather had, and I still have one just like it. And I recognized that more than this, the algorithms which you saw before. That's my generation, or maybe I'm just a dinosaur. But every generation transitions to new tool sets, and we, you, are part, deeply part of that transition. And to me, there's both an obligation and an opportunity. You need to mentor also those who don't get it, to do the reverse mentoring, to make sure you're bringing those with us as we move forward. So those who want you to only to use pencil and HB um, can come with you. So anything that can be automated will be. I've added that to my list. And if we think about anything that can be automated will be. The port of Singapore, they can unload and load one of the big uh, post-Panamax ships in about 27 hours. And there's no person. They don't want any people on deck. Because you see how big those things are? All these things are squishy. They don't want squishy things on the, on the site. All the cranes are done by remote control. All the boogies are driven auto- autonomously. There's no people involved. Now, when you talk to contractors, they say, that'll never happen because we're outside and it's, you know, too, too varied. Well, when you unload a ship, it's also outside. So I'm not so sure. If you go to every major mine site in the world today, all of the trucks are autonomous. And the driving on the autonomous trucks are so, so good that they have to put the human factor back in, which is then they have to wiggle down the ramps because they were going so perfectly that they were making grooves in the ramps, and that was a real problem, right? So they had to put that humanness back in there. But again, the drivers don't show up drunk. They don't show up hungover. They're not, they don't drive up ang- show up angry. But if the electricity goes down, the mine stops. <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. Or how about this? When Apple first said, or Google first said, they're going to make it an autonomous vehicle, everyone laughed and said, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no car manufacturer in the world now who doesn't have one. And you think about autonomous. Within my lifetime, it's inevitable that we will already have probably level four autonomy. I believe that. And the impact it will have on our cities is pretty profound. And that's not the first time this has been thought about. Again, I could do a whole little series on autonomous vehicles, but this is the most wonderful thing. It's also this little family playing dominoes. When was the last time you played dominoes? You know, like, really? In a little bubble car with the electric strips going down the middle of the road. But I throw this up there because when we have an electrified autonomous vehicles, we, which we will, our cities and our places are going to change dramatically. And that transition to that inevitability is also something we have to think about, is those tra- the transition. Because this will happen. And I love this because the question for me is, who has the right of way? Right? Who should move? And how will he or she or it move when that right-of-way is established? I don't know that because when we're looking at this, as we're, we're, there will be new rules to the game. When we're on a construction site, who will have primacy? Right? 
that scary robotic arm or the human? Who's going to have primacy? Who's going to have the rule to be the, 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 the number one top dog or cat or whatever you want to call it? So there we are. The last one with air of augmentation is presence. At TED this year, you've all joined us from, uh, I think, the West Bank. I can't remember exactly where. I'm sorry, you've all. But he was talking. He was, gave his TED talk as a hologram. And I tell you, if you would have told me before TED that that hologram would be as convincing as a human on this stage, I would have said there's no way. After about three minutes, I had no idea it was a hologram. It was phenomenal. The presence, the capability with this movement has completely changed, has moved forward in, I'd say, like a light year. The other thing at TED was this. Have you ever any of you done the void, the Star Wars experience? Okay, there's two, there's three of us in the room. Now, I'm not a gamer, right? Not. But I went and did this. And what you do is you put on, this is me over there, you can barely see, you put on a haptic vest, a full headgear, and you go on a Star Wars mission. You go and you sit in a little transporter, you get out of a door, you stand, you stand on a sled, which I, I guess I covered up, and you go across this lava field, and then you have to get something. And you've, got a, you've got a rifle, right, that you're, you're shooting all the other guys. The picture you see on the left is the actual picture of the backside of when you're there. They have heat lamps, so you can feel like you're in the lava. They have a little s smell thing that they just blow at you. I came out of that wanting to go back in. And I said to the guy, the first time in my life, I would pay for a virtual experience. Right? I told, I asked him, I was, he asked me how much I'd pay. I said, I'd pay 20 bucks. He goes, you have to pay 40. <laughs> I said, all right. But it was, that was phenomenal to me. And the reason I bring this up is because this presence was so real that it's, going, again, going to impact how we design and how we think about space and place and time. Right? It was amazing. So already... In offices, I know with, with Google, when we're doing our, all of our design charats, we've got our, our headsets on for hours on end, and we can't, couldn't imagine not designing with headsets now. Okay? And so this is where things are going to be absolutely heading. Okay, um, so that's it. Oh, and then the making, of course. Augmenting making, we've seen many of those already. I, I kind of took them all out because I knew you'd already seen them. But I wanted to show you two projects I think are just way cool. The first one is this is a, an old camphor, uh, uh, camphor tree in, in um, Japan, 300-year-old heritage tree. The owner of the property wanted to put a tea house up in the tree like a bird's nest. So they went and we captured a 3D model, the entire of the tree, and which you can see here on the site, which is right here with this sort of great big slope, and there's the tree. And then once we had the model of the tree, we knew we could model how it was going to grow, we could model how it was going to move in the wind. And then we could create a steel structure so that it could grow with and be built inside of the tree without ever touching the tree. Similar to what was going on down in the lab downstairs. Now, what was interesting to me is that we could never have imagined doing that without computation and without also the manufacturing capability to create the nodes. This was it would have been impossible, absolutely impossible. The second project, and Francis is here at the conference who was the engineer on this, was taking what I would say is this heritage way of looking at wood. In the old days, you'd look at a tree, and the carpenter would look at that tree and say, that would be a great elbow, that would be a great keel, that's a perfect mast, the way the tree grew. They didn't just cut it down and throw it into a, into a, a, a pulping machine. They actually felt what it could be. And so... For this shed, the foresters, when they went into the forest and selected a certain number of trees to be harvested and then scanned, 3D scanned, and then modeled to be put into a truss. Again, the joints, 100% machined, computationally created. It was phenomenal. Uh, and and will, this some, will this become something which is common everywhere? Probably not. Right? But it was just so cool. I just think of it. Anyway, 
So Francis, you got to talk to Francis right here. And we saw this with the placing um, in there. So augmented making, the era of augmentation. We are in a time of profound transformation, but actually profound transformations, both social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. I'm only going to talk about really one. All right? It's the climate. For me, it's absolutely phenomenal that um, there could be anyone who is denying that our climate is changing. This is the Rhone Glacier, the beginning of the Rhone River, one of the two mighty rivers that goes through Europe. And to give you an idea of the scale, the, here are people, right here, okay? And that's the Rhone Glacier, and you see there's an entrance into, into the glacier. And this is what the entrance looks like. You see there's tarps on top of it to try to keep it from melting too, too fast. Uh, you go inside of it, if you can ever go in there, it's worth the tour. It's completely kitschy and really touristy, but you should do it when you pass it because it's worth it. You get to hear 300-year-old ice. When I lived in Switzerland about 30 years ago, this glacier was right here, all right? All right in 30 years, it's going back to here. My son, in this picture, is standing on the bridge which went into the tunnel, which is now here. And the only reason I know that is because there's a sign over here which said, in 1980-whatever, you know, this is where the entrance to the tunnel was. Now, that's, there's no fake news here. This is very real. And that's retreating so that in about 100 to 150 years, the source of the Rhone will disappear. Now, that's pretty profound when we're thinking about a transformation. What do we do? What do we do now? All right. When you're in New Zealand, you talk to the Maoris, when you talk to native peoples, very often they talk about, or the Zulu, they talk about thinking in seven generations. We seem to think in seven-week periods or seven-month periods, and we have to start thinking more about seven generations design and seven generations impact. And this was just a few weeks ago up in the Zermatt area, and you can see all this raw moraine is all from this glacier retreating rapidly. In 1968, not only was 2001 Space Odyssey come out, but the Apollo went up, and I love this quote, we came all the way up to explore the moon, and what we discovered was the Earth. That little blue marble which we have and which we are using together, collectively in this room, to be in this beautiful space. This is our opportunity and responsibility. And we have these Earth systems which are required for us to exist. Right? But when we look at what's happening since the night, up until about the 1990s, we've been kind of puttering along. And since then... This is what's called the Great Acceleration. All of the socioeconomic trends, and if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, all the so social goals are all good. Granted, a few little hiccups right now, but births, education, you know, all these things are on, really on the up. But it's at the cost of the Earth systems. We're overfishing. Ocean acidification is out the roof. Right? Our, our Earth is hurting quite frankly, this great acceleration, which is why we need to understand the planetary boundaries. Oops, come back. The planetary boundaries are the safe operating space for humanity, and we have to make sure that we don't get out of them. And we need to do this with planetary boundary design. Come on, come on. All right, that has science behind it. This isn't hocus pocus. This is really looking at the science behind what we need to thrive. And I would hope that all of us would, could look at that and sort of really think, what does it mean to design within our planetary boundaries? And look at this. Is this the best we can do? Right? The answer is absolutely, absolutely not. This isn't the best we can do. We see it everywhere. Net zero. Is net zero good enough? Not at all. Right? Because of this. This is the world GDP, and we know there's this one-to-one -one relationship between as the GDP goes up, we keep consuming the planet. And this is what we need, an unprecedented innovation to meet our demand as humans and yet not killing our planet. And to me, as, as designers, as scientists, as engineers, this is something which is worth focusing on. 
I heard a Professor Thomas Bloch say a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago in Singapore, his grandmother always told him, said, you know, grandson, we are too poor to buy cheap stuff. And that stuck with me, right? We're too poor to buy stuff like this, gym shoes that are not for the gym, right? And these are not cheap, actually, but, you know, because they all end up there. When you buy cheap stuff, it ends up here. And this is in our buildings. We have to also think about that. How do we get back to the circularity which we require? And this is that EMPA, that amazingly wonderful little experimental room was shown about the circular economy room, which is fantastic. How do we get to the 2,000-watt society so that every citizen is looking at 2,000 watts as its energy budget? Can we imagine our constructions like that? Because we have to fall in love with the problems, not the solutions. I'm a recovering academic. I'm proud of it. Um, I fell in love with lots of solutions. Tensegrity was the solution to humanity's problems. I was convinced when I was at MIT, right? Not really the case, right? To fall in love with the problems and to really dig into them, that's what we need. Our founder, Overup, said, Seekers of truth I adore, knowers of truth are a bore. When you know the solution, you're a bore, right? Seek, seek. That is what we have to do. And I can't not do a talk here in Switzerland without my favorite bridge, the Salgina Tobel Bridge, because this is my last little coda. And Robert Maillard, this wonderful, crazy guy who you should live about his history, he, uh, in 1929, when the Zeppelins were around, the stock market crash, the Lake of Zurich froze in 1929, and that was a phone there in the bottom left. He was given, he could try to get it, he was a heretic, and no one wanted to deal with him because he was, a, first of all, from the you know, wrong part of Switzerland, and he was kind of a communist socialist, and he, and he finally got this Auftrag to build a tiny bridge in this high valley for cows to come home. And he said, okay, how am I going to do this? The typical formwork at that time looked like this and was super expensive. You couldn't really afford to do that. And so he figured out a way to build formwork only to support the load-bearing arch. So he created the formwork for the concrete arch, and then he used the load-bearing properties of the arch to hold everything else up. And that was because he fell in love with the problem, not the solution. And that was the beauty of this incredible peace way up in the air. So those are my different statements. I hope you'll go with them. And, yeah, and you said this morning, the last slide, you still have three. Yeah, you got three. How do you change the future? I asked a friend of mine. You change the story people tell about themselves and about the future they're going to live in. So as I said, you all need to be authors of the future. You need to make sure that we're changing the story. And I said before, reverse mentor. Help others understand that story so they want to make the story with you. Do not ignore them. Don't do this while they're doing this. Right? Don't put your head in the sand. Because as Darwin said, it's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I would suggest to you, those in the room now, you are the change makers. And we need to be adapting to the change as we're making it. And help others go with it. Don't get caught in the fire. In this case, shooting. Or in this case, buffalo skulls. The buffalo did not survive because they couldn't get out of the way of the European settlers who wanted to go and shoot them for fun. Right? Don't be that man or woman, either with the gun or the buffalo. You know, either one. You know, that's all right. So where is my mind when I'm thinking of all this? I am an eternal optimist. And I think I'm, I'm sort of like with jazz. And sometimes in jazz, one instrument goes off and another one gets quiet for a while. It's like any really interdisciplinary design project. It's like a jazz project. And some of you might like jazz and not. I don't like all jazz. But sometimes you have some melodies in there which just resonate. And this is where we are right now. And I think all of us need to play a role in that little jazz band. 
right? Because you need to choose a life that matters. We only have one life in my book. And helping us to survive and thrive matters to all of us. And be the best ancestor that you can be so you can talk to your children, children's children, and others, your students and colleagues, about the things that you did that you're incredibly proud of as you were aware of the challenges which we're facing. So with that, I will say thank you very, very much for the invitation again. And I um, look forward to see what's going to happen on the panel. Here we go. Thank you.